Full Metal Alchemist 2003 and Manga Hood have large casts of compelling characters, most of which share the same names and general appearances. However, comparisons of any of these characters will reveal differences between how they're figured in either version of the story. In some cases, characters who even share the same names occupy entirely different roles. I mean, Manga Hood's Wrath is 2003's Pride, and Manga Hood's Pride is Manga Hood's Wrath's son, while the kid who is Manga Hood's Wrath's son is just, well, a kid in 2003, but 2003's Wrath isn't in Manga Hood at all, but he is a kid kind of like Manga Hood's Pride. I hope it's clear that discussing and comparing these homunculi is a strange task. Before, I wanted to split them up into individual videos and do it that way, but it was pretty clear that that wouldn't work. If I did that, I'd pump out a bunch of 4 or 5 minute videos on each character, flooding your subscription boxes with FMA related content while I repeated the same ideas over and over again across multiple videos. But who am I kidding anyway, I mean flood your subscription boxes? My videos probably aren't even showing up in subscription boxes at this point. Still, I'd rather have one big boy video and hit 14 homunculi with one philosopher's stone, because that's more efficient. On a more important level though, individual videos on each one of these guys wouldn't provide a fair comparison of each show's strengths and weaknesses as far as the homunculi are concerned because even if these characters look the same, they occupy entirely different roles within their series. They serve different purposes. Discussing them all at once is a much better way to go about this. But what exactly do I mean by discussing them? Well, it means I'm using a vague word because this video lacks focus. This is essentially a set of character analyses all uploaded in one video, with some specific comparisons between 2003 and Manga Hood sprinkled in here and there. I'm also using the term discussing because it's neutral. In this one, I'm not going to spend most of the video saying that this is good, or this is bad, or this is better, or this is worse. Instead, I want to spend most of this video appreciating what each version of FMA brings to the table. It's homunculi appreciation time. Let's roll. In Manga Hood, the amount of development each homunculi receives varies greatly from homunculus to homunculus. So to begin, I want to discuss the homunculi who receive the least amount of development in Manga Hood. These are the simple homunculi, the ones who serve a plot function but little else. As long as they fulfill their roles within the plot well, the fact that they lack complexity isn't an issue. Plenty of characters and plenty of works of fiction lack complex characterization, like Nina, and no one complains about that because if you feel bad about her turning into a dog girl, then her job is done. It's fine for some characters to be simple, and who's simpler than Manga Hood's Sloth and Gluttony? In fact, Manga Hood's Sloth and Gluttony are so simple that there's little to say about them at all. Sloth is defined by his laziness. He's a big boy who wants to take a break from his job. The modern man, essentially. His function within the plot is simple too. He digs out the tunnel underneath the mistress and, on occasion, becomes an obstacle for other characters to overcome. That's all there is to him, and that's perfectly fine. He's most present when Ed and Al are in Briggs anyway, and at that point, many other characters like Olivier and Kimberly are receiving their fair share of development. Sure, the focus could have been split further by giving Sloth more of a personality, but that's hardly necessary, and could have easily had a negative impact on the pacing of the series. Just like a wise package of toilet paper once told me from 2004 to 2006, sometimes less is more. And speaking of snacks, Gluttony. This guy eats anything he can get his paws on, as you would expect, you know, from his name. I guess he also gets upset when Lust is murdered and he's worried Father will be mad with him when he swallows Ed. So he shows some sort of emotion too. He's kind of like Winnie the Pooh if Winnie the Pooh thought everything was made of honey. He has this air of innocence to him that the other homunculi lack. Even if I could talk about him a little bit, he's not going to show us anything unique that we couldn't just discuss using one of the other homunculi. And with those other homunculi, those ideas are going to be covered in more powerful ways. He's pretty much there to be accompaniment. He's highlighting other ideas that will show up in different ways throughout the series. He may not steal the show, but he's good to have around. He's seasoning. His mindlessness stands in stark contrast to many of the other homunculi's strategic decision making and higher levels of thought. If nothing else, he shows us early on that there is an extreme variation between intelligence and personality among homunculi. All this stays pretty much the same in 2003. Again, there's nothing wrong with this, but there's also not much to discuss. Manga Hood's Lust, however, is a bit of a different story. Up until her death, she receives the most focus of any of the homunculi. Yeah, I hate that word. I hate homunculi, homunculi. However, she also receives very little in the way of depth or complex characterization. 
Considering how much time 2003 will invest in giving Lust a unique personality and perspective, and how that perspective will affect the plot in major ways, frequent viewers of this channel may expect me to go on a tirade here about how 2003's Lust is better than Mongood's Lust because Mongood's Lust is simple and because I'm biased against brotherhood. But that sort of assessment entirely misses the point of this version of Lust. So what is the point of Lust in Mongahood? Lust sets a precedence for who the homunculi are. They're pawns who carry out father's orders without displaying any desires of their own. So Lust serves as father's mouthpiece until he shows up. She does whatever he tells her to. She's often accompanied by gluttony and sometimes envy tags along as well. From what we see of them before Lust's death, they're both simple too. As such, the human characters are made to be people who have their own desires and goals and perspectives. But the homunculi aren't. They're static. They're just going to do what they're told. And early on, there's no real reason to believe that's going to change. Her death also shows that the homunculi can be killed by humans, which is crucial info for both the audience and characters to have going forward. Rather than showing us something about herself, she's showing us something about the story's world and rules. And that's just as valid a role for a character to fill as any other. I'd much rather have that than some exposition dump about how the homunculi work. In this way, Lust helps put the reader or viewer in the hero's initial mindset. Homunculi aren't human, plain and simple. Just like the humans, reliable to believe that simple distinction will hold. That isn't the case though. Wrath, greed, envy, and pride. All these guys are going to blur the lines between human and homunculus in their own unique ways. Lust may not blur the lines herself, but if she weren't so simple, then these other homunculi's development wouldn't hit anywhere near as hard. Another way Lust sets up expectations of what will come later in the story is with her death. Since Mustang's murder of Lust has such a victorious tone, the reader or viewer is likely to expect all the homunculi's deaths to be treated in a similar manner. I mean, when Mustang murders her, there's no sense of regret or introspection for him or any of the other humans. However, the death that's most like hers, you know, with another guy being burned alive, that's totally different. What's a moment of cathartic vengeance here becomes a major turning point for Mustang's character later. Once again, Lust sets a precedent and then later events change our perception. In this way, Lust may not be all that interesting in and of herself, but she serves the story well. She widens the gulf between human and homunculus, and then later on, that gulf is going to close. She takes A and places it further away from B, making the journey from A to B more interesting later. She only does something contrary to this once, just before her death. She tells Mustang and Havoc, We have the same appearance as you, the same five senses, the same emotions. We have the same love for our parents that gave birth to us. We're human. She sets the stage for the rest of Mangahood. In stark contrast to Mangahood, 2003's Lust receives more focus and development than any other homunculus in that series. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that she serves as the most powerful example of the internal conflict that defines many of 2003's homunculi. After all, the fact that homunculi are the result of human transmutation entirely changes their role within the story. They go from being father's creations to being alchemist's creations. By extension, they serve as a major source of internal conflict for Ed and Al, who have to deal with the fact that they made one. Based on this, Ed and Al question the homunculi's humanity and their unwillingness to take a life. The more human the homunculi seem, the more powerful this conflict is. As 2003 goes on, Lust explicitly questions her own humanity. While other homunculi's actions betray their connection to humans, she has a pointed internal debate about identity and what it means to live. This way, she goes from a seemingly one-note character who manipulates others to a conflicted character who has difficulty discarding her past life. Much like Al, she wants to regain the human form that she seemingly lost, and questions where her memories came from. As she says, homunculi just want to be human. That's all. There isn't as much of a difference between the heroes and villains as we would have initially expected. No single episode of 2003 does a better job of exemplifying Lust's internal struggle than episode 35, Reunion of the Fallen. In this lust centric episode, we learn about one of the homunculi's past attempts to get humans to create a philosopher's stone. After sending a disease out into a town that kills many of its inhabitants, Lust goes in and finds a desperate alchemist named Lujan. She teaches him complex techniques and provides him with a bit of a philosopher's stone. Using this, he can heal his people. However, once he falls in love with Lust, Lust leaves the town. Later, she returns, kills Lujan, and heads out. Throughout this episode, Lust asks herself, Where did I come from? Where am I going? In order to explore this seemingly vague question, we see how Lust connects Lujan with Scar's brother, and how memories of her past with him invade her life now. And these memories are strange. She sees them as an onlooker would. 
There's a disconnect there between the person she's based on and who she is now. They aren't quite the same, but she can't break that connection. From the fact that she flees the village, it's clear that she's conflicted about these memories. She doesn't like when she remembers them, but they still dictate her actions to some degree. And that's probably why they make her uncomfortable. They interfere with her goal of getting a Philosopher's Stone and becoming human. After all, they're part of the reason she can't bring herself to manipulate or harm Lujan anymore. As she says herself, Lujan is her small blemish, and he's only a small blemish because he betrays the conflict of identity raging on inside her. I mean, if she really wants to be human above all else, why not continue to go on with the plan? Or if he's not good enough to carry out the plan, kill him. He won't help. He can't do anything. Well, the only reason not to is because she's developed some sort of feelings for him. Ironically, her feelings for Lujan are one of the most human things about her. However, since her memories and reasoning here are tainted by her past self, she becomes uncomfortable with her feelings and rejects them. As such, when she kills Lujan and abandons the village, she is proving to herself that the memories from her other life won't influence her actions here, and that she'll do whatever it takes to get the Philosopher's Stone and become human. But by doing this, she's also distancing herself from humans by acting in line with the Homunculi's quest, and not with her human impulses and empathy. For all these reasons, this episode paints Lust's struggle as one of individualism rather than retrieval. She doesn't want to regain her old life. She rejects those memories in that past by killing Lujan. She wants to be her own person, her own individual. That all sounds good here, but later on, Lust makes it clear that she believes that a Philosopher's Stone can turn things back to normal, that she can regain that life and be that same person. Does she want to retrieve that old life, form a new one, or do something in between? It's never entirely clear. But that's a big part of what makes this internal conflict for Lust feel genuine and interesting. She contradicts herself constantly. She can't help but be moved by humans' actions, like Scar jumping in front of a bullet for her, and yet she wishes she could detach herself from such things. She longs to become human, but she isn't ever able to articulate exactly what that even means. She tells Ed that she knows who she is, but she's clearly conflicted about who she is and where her personality comes from. When Sloth calls Tucker's Chimera useless, she says, it's his daughter, once again hinting at her deeper understanding of human relationships and motivations and her ability to empathize with them. But she also does such horrible things, and hurts so many people. Again, there's a lot of contradictory stuff going on here, but that's okay. Lust, more than anything else, is a question mark. She's constantly changing, reevaluating herself and coming to different conclusions about what the best course of action is. She forces the audience to question Ed's assertion that homunculi are monsters who don't have souls. Fittingly, her time in the show ends with a question, when she says, I wanted to die. Even in the end, she's uncertain about what exactly it is she wanted from life, and whether she'll find that unknown thing in death. She shows that answering questions of humanity, individuality, and finding your own way isn't easy. She poses the question, what does it mean to be human? And then shows us that maybe there isn't an answer to that question at all. Despite what Manga Hood's Lust says about the homunculi being the same as humans, she also importantly states that we homunculi are closer to the truth than you humans. You could say that we're the next link in the evolutionary chain. Other homunculi consistently say the same sorts of things. This way they grant themselves the status of superhuman. However, with Manga Hood's wrath, pride, envy, and greed, the parts that seem to make them superhuman are broken down. Until eventually the reader or viewer is shown that these homunculi at their core have some sort of human element to them. Let's start with Wrath, or as I'm going to refer to him from now on, Bradley. In the manga, right up until it's revealed that he's a homunculus, Bradley is portrayed as a pretty good guy. He's introduced as a somewhat silly but competent leader, who seems to take quite a liking to Ed. After all, even after Ed does something that could easily be interpreted as an act of treason, he lets Ed join the military as a state alchemist. When Ed slaps together some report after forgetting about his alchemy assessment, Bradley simply tells Ed that his work's quality is self-evident, giving him a big old stamp of presidential approval. He even brings Ed an expensive gift when he's recovering in the hospital. And yeah, I just called him Ellen an expensive gift. Fruit prices in Japan are insane. I don't understand how anyone can ever eat a melon there at all. Anyway, aside from one scene where he shows his violence in the first episode of Brotherhood, this remains the same there too. However, after we learn he's a homunculus, Bradley's true character is revealed. Bradley sees someone he doesn't see an individual. He simply sees a person. A single person, with only the worth of a single person. This means that to him, people are replaceable and interchangeable. As such, when Lin carries a wounded Lan Fawn out of battle with him, Bradley calls the girl a burden and sees no reason why Lin should keep carrying her. As he says when an Ishvalan leader offers his life in exchange for his peoples, one person's life is only one life. 
Nothing more, nothing less. He gives no credence to human sentimentality and idealism. He views everything in a cold, callous, and logical way that's entirely removed from human emotions and from their perspectives, and even goes so far as to frame this Ishvalan's man's act of sacrifice as some mistake fueled by self-importance. By extension, Bradley has no interest in pursuing the so-called truth that so many other characters in the series strive towards. At first, this may seem strange, since Bradley is both human and homunculus. However, Bradley's backstory provides a clear reason for his thoughts. He's a man who's been stripped of his individuality and who, by his own admission, doesn't even know if the soul controlling his body is his original one or some other one that took control when he absorbed the Philosopher's Stone. Later, he concedes that pretty much everything in his life has been handed to him or decided for him and that the only thing he ever chose for himself was his wife. Bradley is unable to know anything about the very nature of his existence, so how could he possibly aspire to understand loftier concepts like the truth? He doesn't even know who he is, never mind who all these other people are. As such, the human pursuit of truth and knowledge means nothing to him. He takes humans and their feelings at face value. He doesn't have the capacity to soul search because he doesn't even really have a single soul. More than anything else, he's a man without an identity. For this reason, Bradley rejects typical notions of truth and idealism. He states that nowhere on this earth does a true king exist. He confidently claims that God is a human invention. He spearheads the war that crushes Mustangs and many other people's youthful ideals. But regardless of how closely Bradley follows his script, and regardless of how much he doesn't understand other people, Bradley's human side eventually surfaces. Because Bradley finds happiness when he engages in human struggles and makes human choices. For one, he consistently comes back to his relationship with his wife. Though his feelings towards her are somewhat ambiguous, he at least sees her as important because she represents a choice that he made. Through choosing her, he's enacted his will on the world, done something that marks him as him, as an individual, as something other than a role that has been handed to him. In addition, he finds it amusing when the heroes do anything he doesn't see coming. He may say that humans doing something unexpected is really upsetting, but he's grinning when he says it. He wants to be able to make his own choices, and these hiccups give him more of those moments. Finally, he finds meaning in life through his mortal battle with Scar, stating, It's an amazing feeling, embracing mortality, knowing that the next fight won't stop until one of us is dead. Rank, class, nationality, race, gender, name, none of these things matter now. Nothing is holding us back. We fight only for ourselves. That's what it means to live. Yes, it's all been a long time coming. And what do rank, class, nationality, race, gender, and name have in common? We're born with these things, or someone else grants them to us. Here, he rejects all the labels that father ever thrust upon him. His rank in the military, the name he gave him, the nation he forced him to lead. And he fights for himself. When it's his life on the line, when it's his fight to win, then he can live. Because in that moment, he's able to live for only himself. He may not know what soul is controlling his body, or who exactly he is but he knows that he only has one life. That's the little piece of being human, of being an individual, that's been left for him. And it's there that he finds a life worth living. In Mangahood, Bradley is Wrath. In 2003, however, that position is taken by a different character. Instead, 2003's Pride is Bradley. So I'm just going to call him Bradley again so that we don't all get very confused about what's going on. 2003's Bradley gets far less development than Mangahood's Bradley. But like Lust and Mangahood, maybe that isn't such a bad thing. He could still fulfill his purpose well. So what is his purpose? Well, he counters Mustang by representing his biggest failure. Much like Ed sees the other homunculi as his responsibility, Mustang sees Bradley as his. Even if he needs to sacrifice everything he's done to gain power and influence within the military, his sense of responsibility implores him to kill Bradley. Bradley, after all, has spent all this time right in front of him, manipulating wars for the sake of creating a philosopher's stone. Their fight happens in the final episode of 2003, making it an integral part of the television series' climax. So who is Bradley in 2003? Well, Bradley, like Envy, has an extremely low opinion of humans. He views Lust's feeling for Scar as foolish. When Archer acts against his orders, he says that Dante's thoughts are lost on the likes of humans, and he plainly tells Mustang that people are fools, and that, by protecting them from their own foolishness, he's similar to one of God's apostles. He also hates alchemists, saying that they're devils. And it makes sense that he would hate them. After all, if he thinks humans are so stupid, why would he like humans who attempt to become more than just 
normal humans through the use of what's basically magic. All in all, yeah, he just does not like humans and seems to be more concerned with keeping the Philosopher's Stone out of their hands while still making one for Dante than becoming human himself. All this is to say that he sees himself as well above humans. But that isn't the whole story, because in the second last episode of the TV series, he does something really strange. He gives his son Selim, who in 2003 is just some kid and not a homunculus, a key to the safe that contains his human remains. This raises some questions. First, why would he keep the remains at all? Second, why give Selim a key to the safe? Isn't Selim one of these foolish humans that he hates so much? The show provides no answer to either of these questions, so the only thing I can do is speculate. Since the other homunculi in 2003 are attracted to things from their human lives, it's not hard to imagine that he would also be this way, and that his version of that is keeping his skull close by. And then giving it to Selim, I mean, even if Selim is human, Selim's his son. Maybe part of Pride's pride is assuming that his son won't be like other foolish humans. Maybe this is a sort of test for his son. If he passes, then Bradley can see him as greater than other humans and feel successful as a father. If not, then, well, you know, maybe he'll just choke him. Like I said though, this is all speculation. With other homunculi, there is a lot of ambiguity going on, but there are still details and hints left here and there that we can piece together. I'm not a fan of how the series handles ambiguity with Bradley though. Sure, the conflict between him and Mustang works well enough on a conceptual level, with the soldier taking on the king who betrayed the country, but I want to know more about Bradley's motivations. After all, he does some very stupid things in the last two episodes, and those stupid things are the only reason that Mustang wins. I'm not complaining about Bradley doing something illogical here. It's fine for him to do that. Characters should do illogical things based on their own faults and desires. In other words, as long as their motivations are properly explained, it's fine because it makes sense to that character, even if, from an outsider's perspective, it's not the best idea. For this reason, Bradley and Selm's relationship should have been explored deeper, and we should have seen the reason why Bradley would make such a huge mistake. Even if certain details about that reason could remain ambiguous, some details are necessary. Otherwise, it feels like Bradley just does what he does so that Mustang can kill him. Because of this, I find Bradley to be one of the less interesting homunculi in 2003, and I actually think he's the most mishandled, especially when compared to his counterpart in manga hood. Envy's death in manga hood is nothing like Bradley's where Bradley dies with a smile on his face after fighting for his life, Envy kills himself. But why does he do it, and what does his end tell us about the rest of mangahood? Envy's most defining trait is his hatred for humans. He relishes opportunities to torture them. He monologues about how he killed a child, in turn causing the Shvalin War of Extermination and the death of an innocent man. He tells Marco that Marco doesn't have the right to a peaceful life or to find peace in death, torturing him by feeding his sense of guilt. As he dons the face of a loved one, he finds great enjoyment in their suffering. Then, whenever a human shows him even the smallest amount of what might be pity, he flips. He doesn't want them to find any point of connection between him and them. His existence is defined by sowing seeds of resentment between people and enjoying the ensuing carnage. Yet this means that Envy must, even if he isn't willing to admit it, hate himself on some level. After all, he's a leviathan of sorts, composed of human souls smashed together into a grotesque, shape-shifting body. These humans, their pain, their suffering, their deaths, they're all a part of him. Yet he tries to escape that, turning into something else, keeping his real self hidden as much as possible. He's a fractured creature, composed of suffering human souls. Like Bradley, he lacks individuality because he can never know who or what he is. He's nothing more than accumulated pain. However, while he only has hatred, the humans have so much more. For one, they can work together with one another for a greater purpose. Mustang realizing this is one of the most powerful and effective moments in the series. When I watched Brotherhood for the first time, Mustang hunting Envy down, it just felt so good and badass. I mean, he was finally going to kill the bastard who murdered his best friend. He'd get the revenge that he'd been waiting for, and actually it's a revenge that I was waiting for too. The payoff I'd hoped for was finally here. But as the other characters questioned Mustang's motivations, the whole tone of the scene changed. Mustang said that he would live for a greater purpose, that he would live for others. And yet here he is, ready to give in to his own feelings of hatred. By shooting an Ishvalan child, Envy kickstarted a cycle of hatred, a cycle that Mustang fed with his flames and that he almost fed again here. But Manga Hood's idea is that the only way to end this cycle is to let the hate die. To leave the hate alone 
and then there's nothing left for it to do but erase itself. That's what Envy shows us about Mangahood and why he works so well as a villain in that series. He shows us that hatred can be overcome through finding a greater purpose and through working together with others. He shows that reconciliation is more noble than revenge and that it can be a more powerful motivation too. Like Mangahood's Envy, 2003's Envy's hatred for humans is unmatched by any other homunculi in that series. He echoes Dante's words, saying that a hundred years go by and humans never change. When he's angry, he calls Bradley a human poser. He has no interest in Wrath's relatively human desire to bring his mama back. He doesn't care that Dante's been tricking the homunculi all along, and that she has no intention of making them human, because as long as he gets to see humans suffer, that's good enough for him. He even expresses a desire to outlive humans, stating that only the homunculi will survive. Yet, like the other homunculi in 2003, he is still drawn to the things that remind him of his previous life. Though he hates humans, he grows enraged when Ed refers to them as created beings, yelling about how they're born, not created. In doing so, he both rejects his connection with humans and expresses a desire to keep some level of connection there. He doesn't want anyone to forget why it is that he would be so angry. Once again, the homunculi are portrayed as internally conflicted beings who question their own identity. But this makes sense because Hohenheim, who created him, rejected him as a monster. For this reason, he hates Hohenheim, Ed, and Al, and by extension, the rest of humanity. In that way, he's not so different from Mangahood's Envy, who's jealous of humans because they have relationships he's incapable of having. Here though, that jealousy takes a much different and more pointed form. As such, Envy serves as a deep contrast to lust. While she wants to gain the status of human, he simply wants to take that status, or life, away from everyone else and be the last one left standing. Unlike any of the other homunculi, Mangahood's greed is immediately introduced as someone who has individualistic goals. As his name suggests, and as he's sure to say, he wants money, women, power, immortality, and a whole lot more. But that's not all that's different about him. Despite his grandstanding, he's a lot more sensitive than the other homunculi. In particular, this scene stands out to me, when Al tells Greed that his brother is gone, and Greed misinterprets that to mean that Al's brother is dead. Instead of getting upset, Greed is worried that he was insensitive. Even if the scene is played up comedically, that doesn't affect the meaning. Greed, when learning that he may have just lost his ticket to getting what he wants most, is more concerned about a boy's feelings than he is about a setback. His affection for humans doesn't stop there though. In fact, he surrounds himself with them, with outcasts who have nowhere else to go. Yeah, he may refer to them as his possessions, and you know, that's a, that's a scary thing to do, but he's clearly inspired something in them. They're all willing to fight and even die for him, and he did give them a place when they had nowhere else to go. They care about him, and even if it's in his own strange way, he cares about them too. Then, when he comes back into the story again through Lynn's body, he gives Ed and Al a message from Lynn and offers them advice when Bradley is using Winry as a hostage. He's willing to say that he's counting on humans even though he's supposed to be fighting against them. When Greed kills one of his friends from the past, he regrets it, breaks down, and abandons his role as father's pawn. In stark contrast to the other homunculi, he has principles and relationships and individual desires. He has a code that he follows. All this is to say that Greed is very different from the other homunculi both in terms of his characterization and his role within the story. More than any other homunculus in Mangahood, he blurs the line between human and homunculus through the combination of his actions and his shared body with Lin. This blurring exemplifies Father's greatest mistake, underestimating human emotions by viewing them as one-dimensional, simple hindrances to be discarded. Alright, so greed sounds like a bad thing, just like any of the other seven deadly sins. But is it always bad? Well, that depends on how you conceptualize greed. If we think of it as a willingness to get whatever you want for yourself no matter the cost, then yeah, I'd say that's pretty bad. But what if, like Lynn, we tweak the meaning of the term just a little bit? What if we have a more moderate or flexible definition? In that case, greed could be a virtue of sorts. After all, Lynn claims that greed isn't worthy of his name because he gave up on his friends. Because of his greed, greed can't leave the past dead and buried like Bradley and the other homunculi want him to. Because of his greed, greed fights against father, teams up with Ed and Al, and help save the world. Greed even says to Ed, the way I see it, greed is no different from hope. The problem is you humans are always trying to apply a hierarchy to greed, what's noble to desire. Then once Lin regains his own body, he also channels greed in order to protect May's clan, proclaiming that greed has rubbed off on him. 
And really, is this conception of greed so different from Ed and Al's idea to never let someone else get hurt during their quest for the Philosopher's Stone? They want it all. They want their bodies back, their friends to be safe, the world to be saved, and they want to do all that without needing to act against their principles at any point. Again, if we just change the way that we think about the term greed for a second, it's not necessarily bad. And these other deadly sins can have names that aren't negative too. Greed could be desire, let's say. Pride can already be a positive if you take pride in the right things. Wrath could be seen as indignation. If we reframe how these supposed flaws are handled, they aren't necessarily flaws. Instead, they're part of a continuum of emotions that can be good or bad depending on the way they're used. As such, even before he shares a body with Lin, greed's avarice fuels his humanity. Lin simply serves as a catalyst for that process. In doing so, greed shows that homunculi aren't completely controlled by father. They can make decisions for themselves. They can remember things that father tries to take away from them. Their individual experiences are theirs, and they shape them. In this way, right up until Greed sacrifices himself to help his friends, Greed fulfills his role in the story. To show that the homunculi and humans aren't all that different after all, and that one of father's fatal flaws is viewing human emotions as overly simplistic hindrances. Greed appears in the least amount of episodes out of any of the homunculi in that series, but he's still integral to the story and he's incredibly interesting. So who is this version of Greed and why does he matter so much even if he's in so little of the series? Greed does something seemingly stupid when he goes back to Dante's house, but unlike Bradley, reasoning for Greed's actions is provided. After all, it's clear that there's some sort of relationship between Greed and Dante and later, it's revealed that Dante made him. So even if going back to see her again is foolish, it's understandable that he would want to go back. Additionally, Martel later states that Greed chose death over being locked away. If Greed felt that he couldn't escape Dante and the other homunculi forever, it's easy to understand why death might be preferable. This way, he can die on his own terms. Like Mangahood's Greed, this Greed provides a place for outcasts who have nowhere else to go. Even though he doesn't want to become human, he doesn't reject humans. Rather, he accepts all sorts. As he says, whether we're homunculus or human, it doesn't matter. We live only to be faithful to our desires, don't we? This acceptance inspires incredible loyalty in some of his comrades, who are willing to die for him or go on quests for vengeance. But his most important role in the story is as a catalyst for change in Ed. Throughout 2003, Ed's ideals and conclusions about the world are continually challenged. At this point in 2003, Ed doesn't want to kill anyone. However, he also needs to take care of the homunculi. So, how exactly is he going to take care of them if he's unwilling to kill them? Will he change their personality somehow? That doesn't sound like a bad idea necessarily, but for some of the homunculi, particularly envy, pride, and gluttony, that seems pretty unlikely. And what about enemies other than the homunculi, like Dante? Dante doesn't care about people at all. She hates people and sees herself as above them. Changing her mind about that is going to be quite the challenge. All of this is to say that Ed needs to confront a truth about how the world works if he's going to want to save it from Dante. Even if he doesn't like it, even if it's against his ideals, taking care of the homunculi and Dante may mean killing them. Greed teaches Ed this lesson by tricking Ed into murdering him. His reasoning for doing so is simple. He wants someone to kill the other homunculi, and he thinks Ed is the most likely candidate. However, he also doesn't think Ed has the guts to kill someone. If he tricks Ed into killing him, and tells him the way to kill the other ones, then maybe Ed will feel committed to this cause and be able to kill again. In doing so, he dramatically alters the course of Ed's development, and Greed's complex and nuanced motivations are made clear. He's willing to live for a greater purpose than his own individual life, and willing to die to get what he wants. Once again, a homunculus has humanity, and that's the perfect way to provide a new challenge for Ed going forward. Can he kill the homunculi, if they're a lot like humans? Selimer Pride is the only homunculus to survive mangahood, despite doing nothing to redeem himself. In fact, he's consistently cold and callous, even to the other homunculi and people he works with. He consumes gluttony and Kimberly, he berates greed for abandoning his honor as a homunculus, he's willing to sacrifice his mother despite having affection for her, and he's just generally a bit of a dick. He doesn't really do anything to make him all that much more complex than lust. He mainly shows us more about other characters' motives and philosophies, like Ed and Kimberly. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, because he builds upon Greed's arc by being raised as a child. 
This way, he represents the possibility that homunculi can be like humans, that they always had that capability, and that Ed's ideals about saving anyone applies to them, too. He represents the potential for anything because, depending on the way he's raised, he could become any sort of person. So it's important that he was simple and evil beforehand, that there wasn't that complexity to him. Because even when he was that far gone, he could still possibly change if only he was taught the right things and raised by the right person. So the quest for individualism that defined much of Bradley and Greed's journeys is carried on through him. He's one final example of the world not being as simple as it seemed at the start of the series. And one final proof that, at least in manga hood, Ed and Al's ideal to never kill is noble. <music> 2003's Wrath is entirely unique to that anime, and its introduction marks a massive shift in the story's focus. Before this, the show is all about Ed and Al's quest to get their bodies back. Regardless of what other curveballs have been thrown at them and the audience, that much has remained true. But a revelation accompanies Wrath. The revelation that homunculi are born from botched human transmutations. And that revelation entirely changes the course of Ed and Al's journey. Like Lust, Wrath is a tormented character. After spending so much time locked up inside the gate, he's emotionally stinted, panics easily, and clings to his mama. Unlike the other homunculi, he hasn't done anything wrong. Sure, he has Ed's arm and leg, but he didn't steal those away on purpose or out of malice. Instead of having some selfish desires, he longs to connect with others. And why wouldn't he after being trapped for so long? While he finds that connection with Sloth for most of the series, he could have found it elsewhere if only circumstances had been different. Because there's only one big reason that he finds that connection there instead of somewhere better. From the beginning, some people assume the worst about him. In particular, Ed assumes that he's a homunculus and assumes that makes him bad. As such, one of Wrath's first interactions with another human is defined by panic, fear, and blame. To make matters worse, once Ed starts to understand that he could be wrong for treating Wrath that way, the military finds him and wants to capture him. All this makes it very easy for Envy to find him and feed him pieces of a Philosopher's Stone. Even though Wrath spits them out once he learns that they're made up of human lives, Envy tells him that the fact he can eat them means he's not human either. Then, by making it look like Wrath killed Bradley, he manipulates Azumi into attempting to murder him. Of course, this firmly moves Wrath over to the Munculi's side. And who can blame him when this is his interaction with humans? When his own mother attempts to kill him. Of course, the main way the Homunculi continue to control Wrath is by having Sloth act as his mother figure. Whether or not Sloth seriously thinks of him like her own child is never clear, but he definitely thinks of her as his mother. However, Wrath and Sloth's relationship speaks to the nature of the Homunculi's creation and their existence. After all, Wrath was created to be a son, while Sloth was created to be a mother. Regardless of their own attempts to become human, they slide into these roles comfortably, but their adherence to these roles is exactly what leads to Sloth's demise, when Wrath foolishly transmutes himself together with Sloth while carrying a bit of her remains inside of himself. This, of course, gives Ed the opportunity to kill her. But even if Wrath's adherence to this role bites him in the butt, that isn't to say that Sloth accepts this role entirely. As she says to Ed, by killing you, I can prove I'm not your mother. I wouldn't be tormented by these memories. I am not your mother, and yet I feel I am your mother. I almost feel as though I can love you when, because you created me, I ought to hate you. Here, we see that she doesn't want to be her old self. That she wants to make her own choices and be her own individual and separate herself from the reason behind her creation. However, when she dies, her last words to Ed are, Good job. Make sure you tidy things up. So what's that mean? Did she want to be Ed and Al's mother, or did she want to separate herself from that position as much as possible? Once again, answers to questions involving the homunculi's humanity and desires are left ambiguous. And in this case, I like that. These characters are confused about what components comprise their personalities. So why would they act or speak with consistency? They don't know what they want. They don't know what they are. They have memories of their creation, and they have memories of their past lives. But are those memories merely due to transmutation? Or do they have something to do with a piece of their original selves coming back to them? Both for them and the audience, it's impossible to know. And that ambiguity makes Sloth's arc, and Ed's and Al's confrontation with her, incredibly tragic. Rath's arc, however, isn't quite so tragic, even though it's certainly sad. After Sloth's death, Dante puts Rath in front of the gate again and he loses Ed's arm and leg. Afterward, Winry finds him sitting by Izumi's grave. Even after all this, he still gets as close to his mother as possible. So when he sacrifices himself so Al can open the gate to find Ed again, it's a dramatic change in character, but it makes some sense. He has nothing left to live for, so why not help him? His real mother, after all, thought of Ed and Al as her own children. Besides, like Greed, he embraces death. He wants to be with his mom again. Through this sacrifice, he gains at least a moment of happiness, where his mother holds him in her arms, 
and he's able to return to the gate happy instead of horrified. Wrath may have done horrible things, but at the beginning and the end of his journey, he's simply a boy who wants to feel his mother's embrace. And what's more human than that? I want to take a second to specifically thank my patrons for helping me create this video and just to say that if you enjoyed the video I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be having more FMA videos coming out. It'll probably be a while but they will be here eventually and the best way to get notified about that is to subscribe. So uh, anyway yeah just thanks again and I hope you have a great day. Bye bye for now.